So, uh, yeah, welcome back. I guess I didn't see any of you last week because I was on a flight to Kenya. So, um, yeah, I'm Dave and uh, I'm the normal course instructor, but I hope Levy took good care of you last week and uh, at least gave you the basic information for the course. And at least from what I heard from him, it sounded like everything was mostly okay, but we do have a couple little technical glitches to to discuss. But um, yeah, I guess you've been here, hopefully seeing the course page. And this week, our lesson number two is uh, where we're going to continue. But before we go into that, there were some issues with this CSC notebooks system. And if you tried using the uh, Introduction to Quantitative Geology 2023 um, workspace on the CSC notebooks, most likely you had problems that you could not clone the exercise repository. And uh, it gave some kind of weird error message about why that wouldn't work. So um, I think I posted something in Discord about instead of using the introduction to quantitative geology, you can use the GeoPython 2023 workspace for right now. Uh, I will fix the issue with the intro to quantitative geology workspace, but I didn't have a chance to do that yesterday uh, and, or, or this morning. So um, as soon as that's fixed, I'll post again in Discord and then you're free to use that workspace. It will be very similar to the GeoPython 2023, except we need one additional library that's not there. Otherwise, I would just say we work work there the whole time. Um, but anyway, yeah, if you've been trying to work on the exercises using this workspace, it won't work for the moment. As soon as it's fixed, I can let you know. But the suggestion for exercise number one if you haven't completed it already, would be to use the GeoPython 2023 workspace. And in the message on Discord, you can find a link to the instructions to get like the join code so that you can add that to your um, whatever this like space is in the CSC notebooks where it shows which, um, which workspaces you have access to. So that's one issue. Another issue is I've had a few messages now about people asking for some extra time with exercise number one. Um, I'm fine with that, especially given that there were the technical issues that may have like prevented people from working on it last week at the time when they wanted to. So I'm fine to extend the deadline for exercise one until Friday at like five o'clock uh, with the idea being that like if you need to go to the exercise session on Friday to get extra help that you could go there and still have a little bit of time after to finish exercise one. I'm not going to move exercise number two at the moment, but if things kind of get congested and we need to extend exercise two's deadline, that's fine too. I just don't want to start the kind of like domino effect of like each one getting extended. Um, but I, yeah, I'll again confirm this in writing on Discord just so you can see the new deadline, but um, Friday at, at five is fine to have as the extended deadline for exercise one. If you've already done it, that's great. If you have done it and you want to fix some things, now you have a little bit of extra time. And if you haven't done it, well, then you have until Friday at five. Um, those are the kind of pre-class things that I had in mind. Were there any other questions or issues or things that came up uh, in working on the first exercise or the first class session or anything like that. So I'll say the one drawback about having to use this GeoPython 2023, um, well, I guess you should be able to copy the notebooks. Like you were able to work on the notebooks from the first class, I guess, in the introduction to quantity, like in this workspace that was okay during class is that right but it was only during the exercises that you had problems does anybody remember or did it not work for class either just the exercise yeah i think the issue is with the private repository it has problems with the private repositories um, with that particular uh, version of python 
So, um, yeah, for the sake of class today, it's still fine to use this. The reason I suggest that is that if you've already copied the, the exercise notebooks last time in this Introduction to Quantitative Geology 2023 environment, it's probably better to just work in there because you'll still be able to get the updated notebooks there without having to um, like re-clone them in a different workspace. So let's have a quick look here at uh, lesson number two. So basically this week, last week we did this basic geostatistics stuff like how to calculate mean, standard deviation, standard error, things like that in uh, basically how to do that in Python and also a bit about um, the normal distribution or Gaussian function that uh, was part of the exercise. We introduced at least the idea of if you have some expected length of something you're measuring and you get some variation of uh, uncertainty in the measurements that you tend to get this distribution where things cluster around the mean but they're distributed in such a way that you can draw a nice probability density uh, plot using something like Gaussian function. We're going to continue kind of in the geostatistics theme this week um, and there's three topics that we'll cover. So first is about least squares regression. So this is kind of like fitting trend lines to scatter plot data. Uh, so we'll go into that first. Then talk about uh, linear correlation. So essentially, if you fit a trend line to your data, the linear correlation calculation allows you to figure out how well does that line represent the data. Um, so the more it looks like in the data, the more it looks like a line, typically the higher the correlation goes. Um, and we'll see that. And then we'll talk about goodness of fit calculations, which is another way uh, of basically measuring how well uh, measurement and some model of that measurement compare to one another. So it's kind of a calculation. Instead of, you know, you can look at plots and see how close to your, your predictions and observations look on a plot, but the goodness of it gives you a number that allows you to see um, more quantitatively how well two things fit together. So all this stuff is on the course page, but of course we have notebooks for this. And so um, you can perhaps, if you haven't already, open up the Intro to Quantitative Geology 2023 workspace. I'll launch mine and I'm gonna have to clone the notebooks because I don't think I've done that yet. Um, maybe I did when I was testing it, but I don't recall. but it should take just a moment for that to launch. And uh, there's not a ton of material to go through here, but it will at least allow us to introduce the basic ideas and play around with some of these things. Uh, so I'm gonna go, well, first I'm gonna make this bigger so that you can hopefully see it, and then uh, go into the My Work folder where I do not have the notebooks. So it looks like I test cloned my exercise, which probably didn't work. Yep, it's empty. So I'm just gonna delete this uh, here. And then, uh, yeah, just as a reminder, if you're, I guess, is everybody at the stage where you have this uh, intro to quantitative geology thing in the CSC notebooks? And then the thing after this is uh, you need to go to this little git plugin and then click on clone a repository. And you'll get this prop up thing and then we need to go back to the course environment um, where it shows if you scroll down just below the part where it tells you how to join the course environment it has this URL to clone the notebooks. And so you need to copy that one. And so I'll copy that, and then it gets pasted in here. So it's just like this, uh, yeah, like after launching the first time, do this. So you just need to copy the URL that's there, and then paste it in for the clone a repo thing, and then hit clone. It should not ask for any 
permissions or anything, but then you'll see there's this notebooks folder that appears. For everybody else, if you go into the My Work folder and then to notebooks uh, and you go to the Git thing, you'll probably see if you open this Git tool that like after 15, 20 seconds, something like that, they'll pop up a little orange circle next to this like pull latest changes thing and you have to click that to basically download the latest notebooks because I've added notebooks that weren't there last week and if you click the pull latest changes it should download the notebooks for lesson two. So if you did the cloning last week that's great but you will have to pull the, the notebooks to get this week's notebooks and uh, after you've done that if you go to the file browser, you see, should see the L2 folder that's now there for the notebooks. If you don't see the L2 folder, let me know. But as mentioned, we have three topics. And I think our first one is going to be this least squares notebook. So you can double click to open that up. And I'm going to at least hide my file browser just so I can make this big and easy to read. And uh, yeah, you'll find here that, you know, this is basically the information that's on the course page describing the idea of what a least squares or linear regression um, is. And in essence, it's pretty much fitting a trend line to data on an XY plot. So the example we have here that's shown in the diagram is the eruption temperature for magmas as a function of the uh, weight percent uh, of SiO2 and so as is uh, relatively well known hopefully to you as the weight percent of SiO2 uh, increases the eruption temperature goes down in other words things that are more felsic tend to erupt at lower temperatures than more mafic um, or higher uh, lower silica content uh, melts so if we were to have these kind of four different points, perhaps for different compositions, the four points would be there and you could fit a nice line to those data. And in this case, the line basically falls right on top of the data points. So it's a pretty good representation of what's happening as the silica content increases, the temperature is going down more or less linearly. Of course, that would be nice if that was our observations from the data sets we're working with, but I would always be a bit suspicious myself if my data looked like this because very often the case is that there's much more scatter um, than, than what you would have here. But this is an example of a case where we think that the change in uh, the eruption temperature would be a function of the, the silica content and sure enough that works nicely here. So in order to do this, what we're going to do and in order to fit a trend line here, uh, we have to think about two things. One is the kind of definition of what is the line and then there's the kind of fitting part. So we're given the, here an example of just the equation of a line. Hopefully this looks familiar in some form. I think there's lots of different forms of this same equation using different letters. But we're going to use this version because it works nicely with the explanation for how to find the coefficients. But in essence, if you have some line, you can find the value that you should plot on the y-axis as a function of some constant a, which is the y-intercept, or where the line would cross the y-axis, plus b times the x position that you're at, so where b would be the slope of the line. Uh, I know this one is y equals mx plus b, but uh, again, I followed a textbook example just to avoid making mistakes in my equations, so we have y equals a plus bx. But I guess you've seen the equation of a line before, Nothing necessarily exciting there. But in order to do this kind of plotting of the line, we need to be able to figure out, okay, well, what we need to do is to know what our values of A and B are in order to go to any position X on the plot and figure out what the Y value should be. And uh, in this case, you know, if we have, for instance, um, in our model, a position X and we think that the line is a very good representation of our data set, we should basically be able to recover the true value of y as a function of this y-intercept plus the slope times 
uh, the position x where we are at. So um, this is essentially the idea that we can use the line as a model, and that's the approximation we're going to make, make here. And I suppose this is nothing kind of mind-blowing. So then it becomes a question of how do you get these values of a and b to define the position of the line. And this is described in uh, one of the textbooks that's referenced on the course page in, uh, in chapter number eight and shows a kind of full derivation of how you get there. But in essence, there are these two coefficients a and b that we want to find that are just a function of various summations and products of the x and y positions. So um, this sigma notation, I don't know if this is familiar to you at all. Have you seen this before for summations? Yeah. So in the way that it's written here, we're omitting the uh, like the x or, or sorry the uh, the indices like i. Uh, so this is kind of like a shorter, more compact version of the sigma notation. But basically, this would be, for instance, the summation of uh, the square of all the values of x times the summation of all the y values minus summation of all the x values, and then times the summation of x times y, and that's then those are all summed. So in this case, it would be you know each one of the uh, values like the first x and y pair multiplied together plus the second x and y pair, etc. For this top summation, I mention that only because it's very easy with these summations to get mixed up and like sum all the x values and then sum all the y values and multiply them together. But here, what you're doing is you're summing the product of the two. Uh, so I suppose that kind of makes sense but we can do a demonstration um, of this in just a just a moment so anyway we have a way to calculate a that's various uh, sum of different things a way to calculate B which is again quite similar in a sense now we have n which is the number of points times the sums of some of these different values and in both cases they're divided by Delta which is just for the sake of simplification here um, written out down below just to make the equation a little bit nicer looking. So then you've got n times the sum of the square of each x value minus the sum of all the x values squared. As you might imagine, this becomes an exercise in Python of keeping track of the parentheses because it will make a big difference. But in essence, with the approach, what we can do is take any set of x and y values that you have and uh, calculate what the values of a and b are that allow us to plot a line to fit the line to those uh, to those data and then yeah in this notebook there's a little bit of uh, in-class demonstration space because we don't have uh, like so much of interactive material in the lesson itself um, but we have some room here where we can kind of demonstrate how some of these things work, and I think we can uh, we can mess around with this a little bit right now. So um, to do the demonstration and to be able to plot things, I'm going to first import a couple things. So I'm going to import NumPy as NP, and you can do the same if you like. I'm also going to import matplotlib dot pyplot as PLT. So these are the two libraries that we're going to need to work with. Um, NumPy, you guys saw a little bit last week, mostly just to learn how to make arrays of, uh, of values and also to see the, the random function in NumPy. And uh, the PyPlot library is the kind of familiar one, hopefully from, from GeoPython or some other course, as it is probably the most common plotting library in Python in general. Once we load those in, we have uh, some possibilities of of what we can do and uh, <clears throat> first off we need some X and Y data and uh, I'm gonna make these as NumPy arrays and uh, actually why don't I let's do it like this to avoid confusion let's start out with some Python lists and then we'll convert those lists into NumPy arrays They'll be easier to work with as NumPy arrays. Um, 
but yeah, let's let's see. Last time I did this, we made a scatter plot of the age of people in the course versus how many years they'd been studying at the university, because that's something you would kind of expect. The older you are, the more years you've been studying. Uh, so that's kind of something where we should expect linear like behavior. Do you have any suggestions of other possibilities? We can do that again, but can you think of something else where you might expect uh, something to increase, for instance, with time? Because that's that's always a good choice. And we can like this is total. I mean, it's just a toy example, so it doesn't really matter. If you've got any kind of ideas, uh, I'm willing to just see how it looks in fitting our uh, regression line. Can be our yeah, little data set to play with. Height and shoe size. Okay, perfect. And let's do height in centimeters because that's probably easiest for you. Although I have very, I still don't remember my height in centimeters very well. Um, height and shoe size, and we'll do shoe size. Well, I guess this is just whatever. I don't know what the units are for shoe size. <laughs> shoe size units, yeah. So uh, we'll just we'll just leave that like it is. Now we got to populate our lists. So um, why don't we go around the room and we'll do each person's height and shoe size, and we'll collect a data set, and then we can we can start plotting with it. So. Excellent. Thank you for the data. Now we can see what we can do with this. So we have our X and Y data, and we have <coughs> at least some expectation that we should see taller people typically have larger feet. Um, but let's convert these now to NumPy arrays just because it'll be easier to do some of that kind of summation and things like that using some functions in NumPy. So we can just say, for instance, X equals np.array of x. So this is just the numpy way to convert a python list into an array. And we can do the same thing for the y. Now of course we could have called this like height and shoe size for the variable names, but for the sake of demonstrating here, I think it's kind of uh, easiest just to keep it as x and y because it'll make more sense in terms of comparing to the functions and the equations we're going to use. All right, so now we have our X and Y data. We have our X and Y arrays. Now we need to come up with our, for instance, uh, equation for calculating the coefficients A, B, and delta. And uh, so let's start out with A, which I'm just going to put as a lowercase a, just because it's not a good practice in Python to use uppercase uh, variables unless you're using certain style of variable naming. And so A is going to be equal to, it's the summation of the values of x squared. So we could basically take, for instance, our x values squared. And in because they're a NumPy array, we should be able to do dot sum. Uh, I'll put this in parentheses just because it might read a little bit more easily that way. But raising something to a power in Python is just double star, so we're squaring it. This will square all the values of x and then sum them. So that's a nice kind of reason for using uh, NumPy, for example. Then we've got that multiplied by the sum of all the y values. And we're going to have to add some parentheses as, as we go. But, uh, but if we scroll back down here, we know this is going to be times the sum of all the y values, which we can simply write as y dot sum. So if you've done some of this stuff before playing with pandas, you'll see some of these things like dot sum, dot mean. Those are the same functions that are used uh, in pandas but are also available in NumPy. So that's the way to sum up all the values of y. Now I'm going to put a set of parentheses around this whole thing 
because that's the first term in this equation we have here. Then we're going to have minus and then some other stuff. So minus, then we've got a sum of x times the xy sum. So we've got minus, and I'm going to go ahead and just put the parentheses here now to start filling things in. I think it was x dot sum times, and it should be x times y. And if we put that in parentheses and do dot sum of that, that should work for our purposes. So it was minus the sum of all the x values times the sum of x times y. So just double check that we got that right. So minus sum of x and then times the sum of, again, this is each x value times its corresponding y value and then that whole thing is summed, divided by delta. And so then in the end, if we take yet one more set of parentheses and wrap that around this whole thing at the top, we can then divide that by delta, which we haven't defined yet. So we'll get there. But I'm going to put a place in here. Uh, I'll just put it in as none for the moment. We'll, we'll fill in what delta is in just a second. So I think this looks okay. Hopefully you've got something that looks somewhat similar. We'll find out if this doesn't work in just a minute. In fact, maybe we will just go ahead and do the delta now so we can test this. So delta, we had the n times the sum of all the x values squared minus the sum of all the x values and that whole thing then squared. So let's calculate our delta here. So it should be n, which uh, let's just go ahead and calculate n as uh, basically it's just the length of x or the length of y. <coughs> Doesn't matter. <clears throat> but that'll just give us how many values we have. Uh, we could also use like the dot shape or something like this for the numpy array, but this len function is easy to use. So we know we got n times, and it was what? Uh, the sum of the x values squared. So uh, this is going to be x squared dot sum. So we square the values first, and then sum them all up. And then this is minus, and these two look somewhat similar, minus the sum of all the x values and then that quantity squared. So the difference here is we're going to do x dot sum. So sum them all up first. Oops, what did I do? Uh, and then I'll put parentheses around this and square that. You don't really need these parentheses, but I just put them there for the sake of being consistent. So that should give us delta, and, uh, and everything should be okay here. I could just run the cell at this point just to make sure I don't get any syntax errors. It looks like everything seems okay. But uh, let's add our calculation of what is the value for B, and then we can see how, you know, if you have questions or something like that, and then we can take a look at the values we get for A and B and start thinking if they make any sense. So let's get our B value here. This one's going to be n times the sum of uh, each x times its corresponding y as the first term. So then we can say B equals n times, and it should be x times y, and I do need to put this in parentheses, and then dot sum. So we want to make sure that we multiply all the x and y values together first and then sum that resulting product. Um, so when I do x times y dot sum, it will multiply each like one of these heights times its corresponding shoe size 
we get all of those into one single array and then we sum the values up from there. That should be this first term, right? n times x times y and then the summation. And then this is minus the sum of x times the sum of y. So that one's not too bad. So minus, let's put some parentheses around this first term like that. And then uh, I'll put the parentheses here. So it was the sum of all the x values, so we can just do x dot sum times the sum of all the y values, which is simply y dot sum. That should be okay. I can see if I click here that the green parentheses match, so I've got that whole term uh, okay. This one looks okay. But we need some parentheses around all of this here and here before we can divide by delta. So it's the same as the other equation that we divide by delta on the bottom. Okay so far? Yeah, yeah. I'll move the cursor out of the way so you. Right, so, uh, uh, which one? This. Ah, okay. Like, um, well, it's because the sum function is, uh, it is a function. So, like, when you have a function, you have to have parentheses when you use it. Uh, it, but it doesn't necessarily have to have a parameter value that goes in there. I don't actually know if you can put anything into the sum there, um, because I think you could. If I'm not mistaken, you could. I think there's an np dot sum, and then you could put an array in there, and it would do the same thing. But this is a function being applied to the array itself, so it's assumed that the data it's going to apply itself to is the array of values you have. But there might be some kind of parameter, or something weird you could put in there, like to tell it to, I don't know, like. Uh, update the values in the array so there might be like an in place parameter or something like that in pandas it has like some of these functions where you can put in place equals true which will then update the data frame that you're doing some calculation on um, but in general any function in python expects to have parentheses that's part of the way in which it operates but it doesn't necessarily have to have a value inside the parentheses it's simply just calling the function you have to give the parentheses this is something actually that changed between like back in the day with Python 2 and Python 3 is there were some functions that didn't have parentheses like print. Print didn't used to require parentheses. So you could put print and then some text and it would print it to the screen like not without being wrapped in parentheses uh, and they decided that that was not consistent with the way Python was working in other places and, and changed it. So, uh, Le Levy, did you have a... Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You could also use that. Uh, the advantage here is that this dot sum is intended to be used on NumPy arrays. So it's, if, in terms of efficiency, it's faster. Uh, so if you had a big list of numbers, for instance, you could sum them with the Python's built-in sum function. But uh, in terms of performance, NumPy will be much faster. In, I mean, in the like under the hood, I think these are actually C like compiled C programs that are running to use the sum, and so they're very efficient. Ah, uh, yes, okay. Yeah, yeah. I guess if you had a two-dimensional two array, you could tell it, like, do you want to sum along the horizontal or vertical axis? Yeah. Yeah, so that's an example of something that could be passed. But there's no required parameter for these kind of built-in functions like this. All right, so let's run this cell again because the first time we ran it, we only had the definition of A, but you should be able to run it now and, and it should calculate what uh, A and B are. And then we can do a nice print. And let's say make an F string. And let's say value of A. And then we can put it in the curly braces like this. And I'll just then copy this thing and paste it and just change that to be value of B and then B in there. 
So in case you don't remember with the F strings, the way it works is basically this is a normal string here, but if you put the F out in front of it, it gets special treatment by Python such that anything that's wrapped inside these kind of curly braces like this, it will try to replace the value inside with the variables value instead. So here it's going to find the variable value of A and fill that in so that when we run this, we should get two lines printed out. One that says value of A is this, and the value of B is that. <clears throat> so now we can do a little bit of a check of whether this makes any sense. You have different values. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is the fun part about parentheses with these kind of equations, because this is most probably an issue related to balancing the parentheses. Um, let's go ahead and add one more thing to our print statement here. So I'm going to paste this one more time. We've got A and B. Let's also just get our value of delta here so we can make sure. This is kind of a typical debugging process that you just print out what the values are you've calculated. Uh, we didn't have delta there, but I have 9,916 for the value of delta. And uh, you can print that out first to make sure, you know, if if delta is wrong, then you're going to have wrong values for A and B. Uh, but if it's correct, then either A or B or both uh, have a problem in the equation. So what I would suggest as a good test here is that, you know, inside of Inside of Jupyter Lab, you can basically, inside a, an equation like this, move the cursor around and see which sets of parentheses match up. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's also possible you should check to make sure you have the right data. Okay. Something must be different somewhere. Okay. But are A and B both wrong, or is only one of them? They're both wrong. Unfortunately, I'll tell you more often than not, the computer's going to show you you're wrong. <laughs> so, uh, unless something really weird is going on, there's there's something different. <laughs> okay. Did you have this third set of parentheses, like wrapping the whole thing before dividing? Uh, you converted them to arrays, and all the values are in the same order. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if it's problematic, we can come back and figure out what the issue is. Uh, you don't necessarily need to have this working. It'll become clear when you plot the data, for example, that your line is not right. Uh, yeah, 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 that's also possible. So let's have a look at our values here. So we had A times BX as the equation of our line. So A then should be the value for the y-intercept, which would be the point at which you cross the y-axis, and B should be the slope. For me, it's usually easier to think about does the slope value make any sense first. And uh, in this case, we get a slope of something like 0.28, so slightly positive, which 
makes sense. Generally, if you think about as people get taller, the shoe size should also kind of increase in some proportion to their height. Uh, so the expectation here would be a positive slope. At least that much makes, makes some sense. Uh, we could also see that the slope is such that the, uh, you know, the values along the x-axis are increasing more or vary more than the shoe sizes do. So that means that your slope is likely to be less than 1. If you sort of height and shoe size increased in direct proportion, you'd expect a slope of 1, but height values in, in centimeters are going to be a bit more spread out than the shoe sizes. So um, the range, for example, of heights is bigger than that is for, for shoe sizes might expect also to have a slope that's then positive but less than one. So, okay, this looks so, like not too bad so far. Y-axis, we cross at minus seven. That one's a little bit harder to envision, so this is the point where maybe plotting the data would make, make sense because uh, it's a bit hard to see just from the number alone whether it makes sense. But it should be somewhere in the negative values or around uh, zero not something a kind of high positive value that would not make much sense with uh, the values we have for instance on the y-axis ranging from you know something like well 39 38 something like that up to uh, to 46 so let's then have a look at what the data look like when we plot this up so we could say for instance ax equals uh, plt dot plot We'll do a just standard plot in matplotlib and x comma y just as a first thing to see what do our data look like when we plot them as an x, y plot. And of course, it looks kind of messy like this because we've got a line connecting them all. So let's add something else here. And uh, that is a little formatting string which we can say uh, let's make our points black with the letter K and uh, we'll put an O to say to plot with little circles instead of um, instead of having the lines there and if you run that again now you get a scatter plot that looks like this where along the horizontal axis we have uh, our heights and along the vertical axis we have the shoe sizes and you can see that they are increasing as expected to some degree with a slightly positive slope. So, so far, so good. We can now, for instance, do ax uh, dot uh, set x label. And uh, this is going to be our height in centimeters. This is totally unnecessary. If you don't want to type this in, I'm just going to do it for the sake of having a complete plot. And uh, we could say this is our shoe size. And uh, yeah, I did something wrong because there's no set X label. All right, then let's do it like this. We'll make some subplot axes first. And then we'll make this just be ax dot plot. <clears throat> So we'll first create a set of a figure and axes, then we'll do ax.plot because the axes will then exist, and then this ax.setx label and set y label should now finally work. We could have also put this into a data frame in pandas and it might have been a bit easier to work with that way because then we could follow that. But uh, Maybe I should have done that because this turned into a bit of a mess as it is. Anyway, the point now is that we have this part of our plot. That is our shoe size versus height. And I would say a line looks like it's going to be a decent fit to this data set. Now, we've got to plot a line. And in order to do that, we can uh, add another plot. Uh, another uh, line to our plot here. So we can do ax.plot once again. And then I'm going to put in some empty Python lists here for our x and y values. We're going to put our line in here. And uh, I'm just going to also 
make this be a red line. So the R and then minus. Uh, this is totally, again, just like this is the shorthand formatting for, for plotting with Python uh, using matplotlib. So the R is to make the line color red. The dash just makes sure it's a line and not some other symbols. And then we have these empty lists here. And the idea with these lists is we're going to have an X min and an X max and a Y min and a Y max where we want to plot our line to go from that X value to uh, the corresponding uh, y value. Now the x values we could for instance say we have here height so maybe somewhere like uh, let's make it go from how about 160 up to 195 for our x and y values. So we could say uh, 160, 195. So that'll be the x min for the plot and the x max for the line we're going to plot. And then we have our equation of a line, which is to say that our line was equal to a times bx. So our first value could be a, uh, sorry, plus b times x. And in this case, we can just put in the 160 we have there. And then comma a plus b times the other value, which is 195. That's our other height value. There's other ways we could do this to make it a little bit cleaner, but for the sake of demonstrating right now, we'll just we'll, we'll keep things simple. So remember that the equation we had is y equals a plus bx, which means that this should give us some value on y that corresponds to what our line would expect at the position x. And in this case, the x is 160 centimeters. And then we should also get a prediction at 195. If we run this, we come up with what looks like a pretty nice trend line fitting our data. So this helps to maybe you know see that yes, the minus seven value we get along the y-axis would make sense. It appears it's just we would have to include the y range to go all the way to zero for heights, which uh, at least for the purposes of our plot doesn't make any sense. Um, I don't think there's any viable human beings that have a height of zero, so. Um, yeah, we have, I think, at this point, successfully fit a trend line to our scatter plot data. So thanks for the suggestion for the idea. We'll come back here in just a moment and calculate what the correlation coefficient is, how well this uh, line fits these scattered points. But we have to first see what that correlation coefficient stuff looks like. Uh, are there any questions at this stage? Did I do anything in matplotlib or Python that was totally unfamiliar? Okay, I try to mostly stick to the way that we teach things in the GeoPython course, but occasionally I do something in a different way than that we teach it. But um, Okay, let's go then to the list of uh, notebooks here, and we'll jump over to the linear correlation uh, notebook now. And again, I'm just going to hide the file browser for the sake of being able to see this. So the idea here with this linear correlation is essentially that if we make the assumption that a line and like fitting a line to our data makes sense because we expect our data to follow some kind of linear like trend, we could fit a different like shape. We could use a you know, parabola or some kind of um, more complicated function for what we're fitting things to, but we just stick with the line for the moment. Um, we could basically now do, ask the question of how well does that line actually fit our data? If we assume it's line-like, we would like to hope that we have some value that tells us, yes, in fact, our data does look like something like a line. And this is done using correlation coefficient, uh, which is often written as a lowercase r and uh, also referred to as the Pearson correlation coefficient. The values for r range between positive and negative one. So a value of one, positive one, would be the value you would get for data that finds perfectly along a line with a positive slope. So you can see, for instance, here that the data are perfectly linear with a positive slope and you get a value of one for the correlation coefficient. 
If it's perfectly linear with a negative slope, you get just the opposite, which is a value of minus one. And in between the two, you have data that really are not represented by a line at all. So this is a sort of shotgun blast uh, data that have no correlation with a linear model. So you get a value of zero uh, here. This is just some figure from, uh, from the Wikipedia article on correlation coefficients, but I thought it nicely shows the kind of idea. What you can see here, for instance, is that the slope doesn't matter. If it's got a positive slope, you're going to get, uh, for, for data that fall along a line, a value of 1. If it's got any negative slope, you're going to get a value of minus 1. If the slope is 0, uh, I believe your, coefficient cor correla or your correlation coefficient is undefined. So I think there's a division by y or something like that in there, so it's going to give you an undefined value there. But then for any other of these examples of different distributions of points, you can see that you're getting correlation coefficients of zero because essentially what you see is that your data don't fit a line. A line would be a poor representation of these data, so um, it would kind of not make sense to compare against a line for data that plot, for instance, in a circle like this. You probably want to be compare, comparing against something that's more like the shape that you would expect to see. But this idea, I think, is relatively clear. You've maybe seen these kind of plots with like r and r squared values before, uh, where the more it looks like a line, the, the closer that value is to something like 1. The r squared value is sometimes used because by squaring it, you get rid of this uh, positive or negative values, and everything's only positive. And uh, then you can see, for instance, how line-like your data are. So the calculation you can do for this um, is looks like this. So you, for instance, take uh, the summation of all the values of x minus the mean value of x times all the values of y minus the mean value of y and you sum that product and then you divide that by the square root of the sum of all the x values minus the mean squared times the sum of all the y values minus the y mean squared. So we can do the same kind of thing that we just did. We're going to have to jump between notebooks or if you like you can drag this tab down to the bottom so we can see the equation um, and go back to the first notebook we were working in because all our data is already there. Let's not mess with copying everything over, um, but let's go back to where we calculated things in our other notebook. So we had n, delta, a, and b, and then we printed those values out. Let's just click on this and add a cell underneath where we printed out the values. That'll be the easiest place to do the correlation coefficient value calculation. So we can start out with r equals and uh, here what we want is to do uh, x minus x dot mean and again if we wrap this in parentheses because this is a numpy array we should be able to just sum that. So x is our values of x, x dot mean should give us our mean value of x so basically we're just subtracting something from that. The output from doing that would be a numpy array of the values of x minus their mean, and then we sum them all up. But before we do this summation, we actually want to multiply by the equivalent thing for the y value. So this is going to be y minus y dot mean. And then we should actually wrap this entire thing in parentheses because the summation that we're doing here would be for all of this stuff. So all the values of x minus their mean, all the values of y minus their mean multiplied together and then summed like that. If we do that part, <clears throat> We can then divide this by, uh, we'll do np.square root because we've got to take the square root of all this stuff down here. We're going to have this x minus the mean value squared. So we're going to do uh, x minus x dot mean. And we're going to have to wrap this thing in parentheses. and then square it. 
So this is basically like what we had up here at the top. Um, except we put parentheses around it so that we could then square this quantity that you get here. Uh, yep, yeah, that should be okay like that. We have to add another set of parentheses around this because what we want to do here is then dot sum of that. So it is a bookkeeping exercise to some extent to keep track of all the parentheses on this thing. But I'll just put a space here between the ones that are in the square root function for right now so we can say, okay, what we have here is x minus x mean. Then we put a set of parentheses around that. So you get this thing, which can then be squared. And then you put a set of parentheses around that so that you can sum the resulting array that comes out of there. At this point, I'm just going to copy this thing because the easiest thing to do here is we're going to multiply this and I'm just going to paste in what we just typed here and change the x's to y's because it's exactly the same equation that's calculated here but just with y instead of x. We could make this easier to read if we wanted to, but I think this hopefully uh, works well enough for our, for our purposes. Now I'm going to run the cell and actually I'll add another cell of output underneath it where we can print out with an F string the value of R and that's R here. So we'll take a look at what the value is that we just calculated. Again, thinking about this and before looking at the value, we have, uh, I'm just gonna drag this up back up to the top where it goes so it's out of the way. We have data that looks like it fits a line pretty well. So the expectation is the value of R, well for one, should be positive because we have a positive slope. And it should be probably pretty close, not exactly one, but it should be maybe 0.8, something like that. These points aren't that far off of a line in terms of the trend that they form there. So my expectation is that it should be pretty line-like. So let's take a look at what kind of value we get for R here. 0.96, okay, so even better than expected. We're pretty close to fitting a line, and I think you'd have no difficulty from the plot alone to argue that, yeah, this data looks like it fits a line pretty well. But the value of the value for R that we just calculated allows us to show that not only do the data look like they fit a line, but quantitatively, yes, the line is a good fit to this data. So we could, for instance, do here an ax.text in the cell where we have our, our plot being generated. And we could put up here, for instance, somewhere what the value of the correlation coefficient is. So for the text function, it's going to ask us for the x and y position where we should place the text. So maybe for the x position, we could put it at like 162, somewhere along this side, and maybe around 46 for the y position. So let's say 162 and 46. And then the text, we can also make an F string. And we could say correlation coefficient. And I'm just going to abbreviate it as coef. And then we could put in our value of r and have it show up on our plot like this. So 162.46 will define the position, so it should put the text somewhere like here. And then it should say correlation coef, and, uh, and then show the value if we run it like this. So there's our correlation coefficient. It's probably a bit extreme to report this to 16 digits of uh, precision. So we could make one small modification here after the R and put in colon 0.2F 
which will tell us to format the value of r as a floating point number. So just a regular decimal value, that's what the, the dot is, with two decimal places of precision and show it as a, as a regular number, like not scientific notation or something like that. And so now you can see our plot with our values and our correlation coefficient. And uh, of course you could do this same kind of calculation in Excel, but the idea here is that maybe now you have some idea where this line fitting comes from and uh, maybe makes a little bit more sense. Uh, in, in the context here. So any questions at this point? Is this kind of somewhat clear how this this works? I could probably bore you with the uh, the details about how the sort of derivation of some of this stuff goes but I think the more important thing as far as I'm concerned is that you at least have some sense of like how you do these calculations to understand a little bit about like when you see an R value what does it actually mean because these are things you'll see on plots uh, somewhat regularly and sometimes you see R values that are quite low with someone trying to convince you that their data falls on some nice linear trend and it's like I don't think so so yeah yeah please Yeah. Yeah, so I mean if we had it's possible to calculate these correlation coefficients for other functions as well. In this case the assumption we're making is that a line is what we're trying to fit to our data. Um, so I mean if we had our data that fell off the line more, you know, if we went and just manually changed some of the values like uh, let's just make everything here, let's, let's make it that these people are shorter. <laughs> so uh, we change a few of them and I'll just run the same cells that we had before. Now you can see there's kind of a weird clustering of points down here because we made all these people short but kept their shoe sizes so they're like kind of clown feet people. Um, but the idea is that because now you can see there's more spread down here that the line values that you get I mean the you know the, the coefficient drops off because it's no longer as line like as it was before so um, it's possible to do this like with other methods to fit other kinds of functions to scattered data sets so like if you had for instance some kind of polynomial function you wanted to fit to your data you could calculate the correlation coefficient as well uh, but it uses a different equation because like the assumption underneath this one is that you're fitting it to a line. Um, but I mean it's possible to do, you know, use exponential functions on others uh, if you felt like that's what you were trying to fit. But the most common thing, especially for geoscientists, is to be fitting a line to their data. So like if somebody had gone and, you know, had some, I don't know, like uh, data set of volcanic rocks they had collected and they had some proxy for measuring what the temperature was when it was erupted, whatever that geochemical tracer might be that tells you like what the eruption temperature was. And then the silica content, you could make the plot like what was shown at the beginning of this, this lesson, um, something like this. And there would be you know some scatter in there and you could calculate uh, what, the, um, what the correlation coefficient would be. But the idea with that is that like I, you know, would be thinking that there should be some kind of linear-like relationship between the two variables that you're plotting. Um, you'll see, though, that this idea of calculating these linear fits and also the correlation coefficients are used somewhat liberally. And so there are some cases where people are plotting data where it's like your expectation isn't necessarily that it would be a line, but they still throw a trend line on there and calculate an R-value. And it's kind of doing a disservice to the person in a way because like if you don't expect linear behavior, why fit a line and say that's what your expectation would be? It's, it's silly. But, um, but yeah, I think by comparison to 
two years ago, the last time I taught the course, this correlation coefficient for shoe size and height, uh, if I put it back to like full size people, um, the correlation you have here is, is better than what we had between the correlation between years of study and uh, age. So there was more scatter in that data set. So, uh, and that would probably be the expectation here to some extent as well, because like some people, you know, may have gone and worked for some time and come back to studying at university. And so like the years of study versus age is a data set where maybe we would perhaps expect a bit more, a bit more variation. Um, I mean, height also varies depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, I don't know whether sort of shoe size and, and height scale equally or whether it's unequal. So it would be an interesting data set to go and collect, you know, samples of height versus shoe size in lots of different countries and see, you know, what do we get similar kind of uh, slopes for our lines or do, does it vary that like, you know, in some countries people's feet are bigger compared to their height or there's like, you know, kind of peg leg people that are really tall with small feet. I don't know. Um, but yeah. Yeah, okay. But uh, are there other, other questions or? We've got one other thing to, to have a look at about goodness of fits, and then we can take a look at what the exercise is for this week. But uh, yeah, if you have other questions, now's a good time. All right, so let's look at the one other notebook we have here about goodness of fit. <clears throat> I'll just open that one up again. I'll hide the file browser so it's easier to see. But the basic idea with the goodness of fit calculation is pretty much what you might guess from the name. Um, and that is to assess how well some prediction fits a measured data set. So uh, for example, what's shown here would be a case of a, a geochronological age that might be measured from some kind of radiometric dating method where there's usually some scatter in the age that's, that's measured. The scatter might arise from, for instance, uh, dating the same sample multiple times, and you get a little bit different age each time you do it. Um, but the basic idea is that you measure the age, and you look at how much variability you have from multiple measurements, and that allows you to then put something like what's shown here in the error bars, which is like the measure of the standard deviation of the age. So, the blue dot itself would be the mean age. The error bars would show you the standard deviation. And um, depending on what you're dating, how old it is, what method you're using, the kind of size of those error bars is going to vary. And uh, in some cases can be quite, quite considerable. Um, and if you had some way in which you were calculating a prediction for what the age is that you would expect to see, uh, those would be, in this case, represented by these white squares. And so, um, you know, if we had some model we were using, could be as simple as like a line that we just say like, you know, okay, well, we expect the age to be this. Like if uh, instead of this being a geochronological age, it could be the age of the person. And we could be then estimating based on what year they are at the university, uh, their age, or we could be estimating how many years of study they have based on their age, whatever. Um, but we could flip it around and play like that. And if you made two different predictions, you could see pretty clearly from here that one of the predictions is quite close to the mean and it falls within the uncertainty of the measurement. So you might call that a good uh, prediction. Or, and the other one is outside of the uncertainty or further from the mean than the standard deviation, which you might consider a sort of less good or bad prediction of the age. Visually, I think that's not a terribly difficult thing to see. Um, and on a one-by-one -one basis, if you were to go to one sample at a time and look at your prediction versus your age, you could kind of get a sense of, okay, well, this looks like our predictions fit pretty well, or maybe they don't. Um, but the idea with this goodness of fit calculation is that usually you don't have just one age you're looking at, but you might have hundreds, you might have thousands of ages, and so we want, instead of visually inspecting each point and the prediction, uh, to calculate a value that tells us whether or not our um, predictions are a good representation of the ages we've measured. So that's the kind of idea. The model for how you get this prediction doesn't matter. We'll deal with that later in the course. But um, 
the basic idea is just about comparing a prediction to something that's been measured. And we can calculate this in a few different ways. So uh, one of them here is a bit of a mouthful, but the weighted sum of the squared errors is what this calculation is. Uh, often it's just called chi-squared because weighted sum of the squared errors is a cumbersome thing to say. But essentially what you do is you take some measured age or um, observed value. You have some estimate. You take the difference between the two and you square it. And you divide that by the standard deviation of the measured age squared. And then you just sum that up for how many ever, however many ages you have. So the idea here is that if the two values were exactly equal to one another, if the observed age and the prediction were identical, this sum on the top is zero. And then it doesn't matter what you divide by, um, you're going to get a value of zero for the, uh, for the calculated value. And if you sum that up and all the ages were exactly the same for the prediction and the measurement, um, then your chi-squared value would be zero. So that's the smallest value you can get, um, which would be chi-squared equals zero if your measurements and your predictions are exactly the same. That should also be somewhat suspicious if that ever occurs because that shouldn't be the case. In fact, you should expect some variability in nature. So, um, but anyway, that's how you come up with the value there. And what you could see, for example, is that this is not bounded. So like the, when we looked at the correlation, correlation coefficient, the smallest value you could get was minus one. The biggest value you could get was plus one. Here, the smallest value you can get is zero. And the largest number you can get is essentially not bounded. It, you can see that it's all about the difference between the measured and predicted ages. So as, as that grows, the value can just go up. But it's always going to be a positive value uh, or from zero uh, and, and increasing uh, as positive values. So the chi-squared can't be negative, which also maybe makes sense because you have something squared on the top divided by something squared on the bottom. It's not possible to get a negative number there unless you put in some non-real numbers. So anyway, this allows us to calculate basically a single number that would tell us how much our measured and, uh, and predicted ages deviate or vary uh, compared to one another. This is fine. The issue here is that as the number of samples goes up, so as the number of ages you're, you're calculating using this equation goes up, you would expect this value to increase and continue to increase, which is okay, but generally you like to think that, okay, if I have more measurements and more predictions and I compare them, um, it'd be nice to see that, you know, the, the number sort of starts to stabilize at some point rather than kind of continuing to, to grow. So there's another version of this equation that's shown down below. That's the one that we'll use more in the course. And that's exactly the same equation as above, but just multiplied by one over n. So this just divides the sum you get here by the number of samples that you have. The reason for doing this um, comes back here to the fact that you divide by the standard deviation. If the values you have on the top, on average, are equal to the standard deviation in terms of the difference between the measured and the predicted values, and the divide by the standard deviation down below, you basically get a value up here of, let's say, 5. And if the standard deviation is equal to, let's just again say, 5, uh, the value you're going to get here when you do this division is 1. And uh, then as, you know, if you had three samples where you're doing this calculation and each one of them, the difference in age and uh, the standard deviations were equal to one another, you'd get one plus one plus one or three for the value you would get for the chi-squared. Uh, as you added more samples, if they followed the same basic trend, you'd keep increasing by one the value for chi-squared each time you add a new sample. And this would exactly offset that. So the point here is that when you use this version of the equation by dividing by the number of samples you have, you can kind of tell uh, in some sense of whether on average your uh, values are equal to the standard deviation 
or varying by less than the standard deviation or varying by more than the standard deviation. We've been going for uh, maybe close to 90 minutes now. Probably your ability to absorb new information is getting somewhat limited, but this is a somewhat important point to, uh, to consider here. So um, I just want to sort of demonstrate or, or sort of reiterate the point that the idea here is that the difference between these two things, if we go back to our visual representation, is basically the difference between uh, this value minus that value. And we're dividing by the standard deviation, which is basically one half of this thing here. So if these two points are like your measurement and the prediction are within the error bars, you should get a value of less than one. Uh, so between zero and one for the um, individual value that goes into this goodness of fit calculation. If your point was right out here at the end of the error bar, you get a value of one. And if you're anywhere outside the error bar, you get a value of greater than one. If you have a bunch of points where you do the same calculation, you can get a sense with this other version of the equation here that when you get the chi-squared value of something like around one, it should mean that on average your, your difference between the predictions and, and observations are, are right around the size of the standard deviation. If it's much bigger, then it tells you that probably you're not getting a good representation. But, uh, no. So, no, it's not possible to get a negative value. At least, I made the sort of half-joking uh, comment here that if, as long as these are real, real values and we're not using imaginary numbers, it's not possible to get a, um, a negative value because you, you have something squared divided by something squared. So it has to be positive for both of the values uh, unless you had, yeah, again, non-real numbers. But we're, as geoscientists, I don't think there are many exceptions to the rule that we deal with real numbers. Other than seismologists sometimes deal with imaginary numbers, but they're, they're the only ones I think who really have to deal with that. So, um, okay, I don't really have a demonstration uh, in mind for this one, but you'll play with this a little bit in the exercise for, for this week. So we get the chance to do this calculation of the goodness of fit, make a function for that. And um, we can kind of come back and discuss that more uh, if you have questions about it. Are there any other questions about this topic before we, we should take a quick look at the exercise? And, uh, but yeah, if there are any other questions about the topic, we can do that first. These are only two options for calculating goodness of fit. There's actually multiple, many different ways you could calculate a goodness of fit. This is for discrete point values. There's also goodness of fit calculations you can do for just like continuous distributions and things like that. But we'll try to keep it simple and avoid that other stuff because it gets a bit, uh, bit more complicated. Let's have a quick look at the exercise for this week. <coughs> so no, no uh, fun story about Uncle Ismo and his disappointment with you this week. So sorry. Uh, uh, I'm mostly a geoscientist, not a novelist, so I can't make up like a nice story each week, but maybe, well, maybe in the future I could, but um, the point for this week's exercise, as you might imagine, is to get some experience with doing things like calculating these correlations. So uh, we'll do least squares stuff first, least squares regressions, then we'll do linear correlation, coefficient calculation, and then a goodness of fit calculation. Those are the three kind of main tasks for for the exercise for this week. And uh, let's have a look at what that exercise actually looks like. So it's here, and I think this is big enough to be reasonably visible. Um, I guess Lavi went over this AI tool usage thing briefly last week. Did he say anything about that? You would have seen it in the exercise and hopefully if you agreed to something like that, you have some idea what you're agreeing to. Uh, but did you guys talk about this last week at all, the AI tool stuff? Does that sound familiar? I'm not getting an overwhelming sense that it sounds familiar. 
Uh, in essence, on the course page, there's something that says you're not supposed to use things like ChatGPT unless it's told you that it's okay to use things like ChatGPT. On some of the later exercises in the course, I didn't have time uh, due to the travel to update this week's exercise, but uh, in the GeoPython course, we had a couple places where people could test out using ChatGPT to do certain things or Google Bard or whatever uh, large language model you want to test out. But um, I'll have to see kind of which exercise it makes sense to, to try it out because I think it's silly for us to not show you how, that you can use ChatGPT to write Python code because you can and uh, you still need to know what you're doing because the code sometimes that it produces is in the worst case is just total garbage, but um, but it's uh, it is a worthwhile thing to to play around with. But in the exercise each week, you'll see there's a little language model agreement thing where you're supposed to put your name, which essentially just says that you're following the guidelines for the course. And uh, and if you're using things like ChatGPT when you're not supposed to, that essentially the university's view is that that's cheating. So um, I'll let you know when there's opportunities. But in the exercise for this week, our first task is to uh, plot some regression lines to the temperature data that was used in the GeoPython course, for those of you who have taken that, which is probably a good fraction of you. Uh, one of the last exercises, or the last couple exercises in the course, is to look at things like climate trends and to calculate things like temperature anomalies. Um, so what this first part of the exercise is about is to basically plot what the average temperature is in the standard deviation in temperature for um, something like 70 years of climate data. And uh, I think this is maybe from like the Helsinki Vanta airport, but I don't remember the off the top of my head. Um, but you're going to plot the data that shows like what the average temperature is and, and uh, standard deviation for the winter and for the summer. And then we're going to fit a trend line to it to see, like, on average, what you know, what is the temperature doing? Is it staying the same, increasing? Uh, probably no surprise there that the average temperature for the different seasons is going up with time. Um, but I thought there was a spot. Yeah, so you get kind of some example of what it looks like here, um, where we have a trend line that we're basically fitting to the temperature data set that we're working with. And then you're calculating like what the slope is because that tells you basically year to year how much is the temperature increasing on average during the different seasons. And you'll do it for two different time scales. So one is like the whole data set. So this is like uh, 1952 to 2016. I think this probably should be through 2019, not 2016. But, um, but you fit a trend line there. And this is the average temperature for the different seasons. And then you do it for the last 20 years separately so you can see how much the temperature change has um, been over a shorter time period as well. Uh, at some point I'd like to update the data files we're using to get like more recent data because at least in some cases the we've had some anomalously uh, warm or cold seasons but um, this is what we're working with. So you're going to calculate the kind of regression line to fit the temperature data after reading in the data file and uh, you're going to do that by making a new function. So your little Python file that you have with the functions that you used in exercise number one, you can just copy that over and continue adding stuff to it for, for exercise number two. Um, and so you'll make a lin regress function that allows you to calculate for some x and y data the trend line that fits those data. So that's step number one. And you plot your results, which is, I suppose, obvious since it just showed you the plot. After that, the next question is, is a linear correlation actually a good way to look at this data set? So we'll calculate then the correlation coefficients to say how well does the line fit the temperature data for the different seasons. Using the same equation we just saw, so no surprises there. And again, because we're doing this in a way that makes sense for working with a tool like uh, programming in Python, you'll create a function for this. So in the future, which a little bit of foreshadowing, uh, you will need to use these functions again later in the course. You have them available to you so that you can then just like, instead of rewriting it each time or putting it into each notebook, just use the function you've already created and tested. <clears throat> so you make a correlation coefficient function that would work by basically just passing in an array of x and y values and give you back a value of r. And uh, 
then you'll do that calculation for like the winter and the summer data sets and for the last 20 years and then you'll plot things once again but this time you'll add the correlation coefficients to the plot kind of like what we did with our demonstration where we put the r values on the plot for the shoe size and and uh and height and of course then it wouldn't be a complete exercise without coming back to the third topic for today's class which is about the goodness of fit so then after that what you're going to do is do a goodness of fit and this is a little bit of a kind of slightly manufactured way to do this but in essence we have a line that's our kind of fit to our data set as our prediction and uh, what we can do with the goodness of fit is that because we have a standard deviation in the temperature for each season we could say go to the year and compare where where's the line for this year compared to the mean value for that season and calculate the, the difference between those two and then divide by the standard deviation in temperature for that season so it'll give us again another way of measuring like how well is our line fitting our data in this case and perhaps tell us something about um, how close to the line are we for different seasons and different reference periods so you'll calculate the goodness of fit then for the for the last part of the exercise and uh, if you think about the correlation coefficient it's basically how line like is our data and then this part is going to tell us like how close is our uh, are our values to falling on the line that we have uh, the two should be kind of following a somewhat similar trend but uh, but they're they're a bit different so after that I think there's a couple questions here that is kind of like free response just asking you to think a little bit about the data set you've been working with and the exercise as a whole so um, maybe yeah reflection questions or something like that any questions at this point yeah I mean, it's like for you for like the open-ended questions, like at, at the end here, a couple sentences maybe, depending on the. I mean, if, in some cases, if it's like you know one kind of to the point sentence, it, that that's also okay. I'm not expecting like certainly not like paragraphs of of response. It's just uh, just think about it for a moment and and you know in as little space as you as you feel like you can communicate what you want to say. Other questions? So, if not, I think Friday, is it 10 to 2 is the exercise session. Is that right? Something like that. So, uh, yeah. Levy mentioned that uh, last week there was maybe five to seven people or something that dropped into that. The exercise sessions are totally optional, but they are a very good place to get help if you're stuck. And uh, especially if you're having kind of like technical problems with the course environment or whatever, um, that's, that's a good place to go to get some, some help. Uh, oftentimes, you know, 10 minutes of chatting with Levy at the uh, exercise session can save you like hours of sitting there like beating your head against the screen trying to figure out what, why something's not working. So, um, but other than that, I think that covers everything for today. Uh, I will post in Discord once I have an updated um, workspace for the CSC notebook so that then you can kind of start working in the same place for everything. But uh, I would say most probably I can do that tonight. I just need to rebuild the course environment and push the updated image to the CSC notebook. So uh, that should fix this stupid problem about the uh, cloning things, which... Um, Unfortunately, I did not realize. I tested the environment with cloning a public repository, thought everything went great, and then found out only after the fact that I had overlooked uh, testing with a private repository. So that's a problem. But if you have other questions, I'll be here for a few minutes. You can come and ask. Otherwise, hopefully you can drop in on Friday. And if not, I'll see you next week for our next topic.